Good evening, and welcome to Woman. Our topic for this evening is sexism in religion. This may be a topic that's new to you and to me, but not to our two guests this evening, who are Audrey Gellis. Audrey is a nationally syndicated television columnist for Copley News Service. Her column, Call Me Ms., appears in 100 newspapers across the United States. Audrey is also currently writing a book on Jewish women, the first portion of which appears in a spring 74 issue of Ms. Magazine. My second guest is Patricia Fogarty McQuillan. Pat is founder of Catholics for Free Choice. She's also coordinator of the Committee on Sexism and Religion for the New York City chapter of NOW and a member of the St. Jones Alliance. Welcome. I'm Thank very you, curious to know how you began your interest in sexism in religion and why. Okay, well, I think for me it came out of my personal exploration uh, of what it meant to be a liberated woman. And to do that I had to examine what it meant to be an unliberated woman. And I realized that while I shared all the oppressions uh, of non-Jewish women, the civic, the social, the legal uh, oppressions, as a Jewish woman I had a peculiar oppression, one that was unique to me and that most of my pain, or uh, let me say a great deal of my pain and of my anger came from my feelings as a Jewish woman. And I, I came to the conclusion that I will never understand what it means to be a woman unless I first understand what it means to be a Jewish woman. How about you, Pat? Uh, yes, when I, uh, it was shortly after I joined now, oh, maybe a little about, uh, about three years ago, uh, Sandy, uh, I uh, finally concluded that uh, most of the oppression that women were suffering all across the board in, in the whole fabric of society, uh, in the employment field, education, uh, you name it, law, courts, everything, uh, was based on oppressive laws, and then as I further got interested in it and investigated it, I uh, found that most of these laws had their origin in, uh, in, in the religious uh, area, uh, namely the Judeo-Christian philosophy. Most of our laws are based on uh, canonical Germanic Roman, uh, Roman law, and uh, I found that we must get into changing uh, the uh, portrait of women that, re that religion has painted over the centuries before we can really get into the changing, changing uh, the whole society, especially the laws in the society. So you really see religion discrimination and religion as the, the root of the whole problem for women then, don't that's you? Exactly what I, uh, that's exactly what I found out and uh, these are things, some of the things that they haven't taught us in uh, Catholic school were uh, some uh, horrible uh, things that various saints, uh, various male saints have said about women throughout history, and it was only when I got into this research that I found out these things. Uh, for instance, there was an early uh, writer by the name of Tertullian he, who wrote at, uh, in the year 150 A.D. He was a Roman jurist, and uh, this is, these are some of the sweet things he had to say about women. He said, woman, you are the devil's doorway. You have led astray one whom the devil would not dare attack directly. It is your fault that the Son of God had to die. You should always go in mourning and in rags. That's a very lovely quote. Uh, then we come to St. Ambrose a little later, and he said, Adam was led to sin by Eve and not Eve by Adam. This is perpetuating that old myth. Um, and it is just and right that woman accept as Lord and Master him whom she led to sin. And then we have the great John Chrysostom, a great canonized saint, who says, among all savage beasts, none is found so harmful as woman. And then St. Jerome, the one that translated the Bible, wrote, women are the source of all evil. We had St. Augustine, one of the top doctors of the church, who is canonized a great saint, and he, uh, it was very dubious in his mind as to whether or not women had souls. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas thought that uh, women ha were uh, incomplete men, and on down the line. Uh, Audrey, is this also true of Judaism? I mean, is it this strong? Ab absolutely. Uh, if, if you read the uh, you Old Testament, you will find that uh, women aren't even counted as people. Uh, that when they tell you the, how the Jews left Egypt, they only count the number of males who left. 
there's 600,000 men, so you, then you could calculate the number of women and children. What are some other ways that uh, you feel Judaism discriminates against women? Well, it's, there's sometimes it's said, you know, that women have second-class status in Judaism. Uh, but the fact is, women have no status in Judaism, except for the status of the man to, uh, to, to which she is attached. Uh, women are so uh, denigrated in Judaism that the rites of passage are not marked for girl children. Are you a practicing Jew at this moment? I was until my non-bar mitzvah. <laughs> non-bar mitzvah. <laughs> but, but I still, I, I still identify uh, very strongly uh, as a Jewish woman. I feel very strongly uh, about my, my Jewish heritage. And it is one of which I, I am proud. But at the same time, I'm very, very pained uh, by the way it has been manifested. For instance, when a boy child is born, there is a bris. Now, this bris is more than just a circumcision. It is the rite that brings him into the covenant with God that is the foundation of Judaism. If this boy child is also the firstborn, there is a ceremony called the Pidyon Haben. If the firstborn is a girl child, there is no celebration. Then, of course, there is the famous bar mitzvah, or today I am a man. Well, you don't very often hear a young Jewish woman say, today I am a woman, or even a fountain pen, or, or what, whatever. And this is, almost every culture has a, a right of puberty. I think this is universal. And I think that the Jews are the only people for whom there was no analogous right uh, for their women. I know there is the bas mitzvah and the bat mitzvah, but it's very, very recent and it's not the same. And when I was a little girl, I used to go to all these bar mitzvahs with my mother, and I used to see this boy up on center stage, and I'd sit, you know, with my mother in the women's section, and say, "Mother, when do I become a woman?" He says, "When you get married, dear." And when you get married, you're not a woman in the full sense either, uh, because in the Orthodox ceremony, the whole show is the man. The man says everything. He puts the ring on the finger. All that the woman does to signify her consent is the fact that she doesn't walk out. I might add too that in the uh, Catholic marriage ceremony. Uh, the woman used to have to pledge to obey her husband, but it's only since uh, the mm -hmm. women's movement really got some momentum up uh, that we did finally succeed in making that one change where they threw out the word obey now. We don't have to use the word obey that, in that ceremony. Yes, that's true. And in the, in the Orthodox uh, wedding ceremony, uh, the basis of the marriage contract is called the ketubah. And though this literally is supposed to provide for the woman, it is really literally a contract in which the man purchases the woman. I wasn't aware of that. Well, That's yes, um, th this this is the literal this is the literal meaning of it. Uh, I should also like to point out, though, even uh, the woman, the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead, only a son can say that. A woman can't say that for any parents or loved ones that that she has lost. Uh, the woman also feels put down in the synagogue. Uh, it made headlines recently when the Orthodox rabbis decided to admit women to the minion. The minion, of course, is a quorum. Uh, until recently, you had to have ten men in order to have communal prayer. Women could not be counted in this minion. And in Orthodox shuls, women have to sit separately in the women's section. Women are not called to read the, from the Torah. So the result, of, uh, the result of all this, the message that a woman gets, uh, is that she is less than, uh, than a full person, less than a full human being. What other message can she get? In Catholicism, it's um, a very good parallel can be drawn mm -hmm. also. Uh, young boys in Catholic school, for instance, can aspire to be an altar boy, for instance, but not the young girls. So this has done psychological damage over a yes, long period yeah. of time. I know I, I could never understand why my brothers were being asked to train to be altar boys when I was older than they were, one year older than my next brother. And I couldn't understand why I wasn't asked to serve at the altar. I would have loved it. In fact, I wanted to be a priest at one time as I was growing up. And uh, much to my chagrin, I found out uh, very bluntly, I was told, that uh, women just aren't priests. And I couldn't figure out why. What kind of reaction did you get from your parents? With that? Well, uh, my parents um, uh, really uh, didn't really, I, I, I have no really no memory about, uh, about what my parents' attitudes were. I think they just let me go along in my ignorance. <laughs> 
<laughs> they didn't tell me the difference. That's fairly and, safe for uh, parents right. to do. <laughs> right. well, I would like to add, I think it's the church's loss, because I think Pat was made a great priest. Oh, thank you very much, Audrey. <laughs> well, Why yeah. not Pope? Someday we will have a woman right. Pope, can I, I guarantee. Can I just want to add that, that it's, it's quite true that little Catholic girls can't participate, you know, be uh, out, auto girls. Yeah, but, uh, but they are baptized. I must correct baptized. myself now, because right. just recently uh -huh. they have been, I know of two very, two churches, uh -huh. one uh, in New York and one in the state of Maine, where uh, they do have altar girls. Now, whether or not that's disobeying the Vatican's edict, I, I just don't know. But I think that the, I, I commend the priests for doing it, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, and the girls are dressed exactly the same as the boys, and they do serve at the altar. In fact, I saw this in Maine when I was in, on vacation this summer, and I just thought it was mind-blowing, uh, because I think, why shouldn't a young girl aspire to all of the religious laws and rituals or whatever you want, mm -hmm. the same as the boys. There should be no, absolutely no distinction whatsoever. Right. But what I you're that saying is that there are no mm -hmm. role models, number one, and yeah. number two, that women are definitely discriminated against. Well, how do you assess the damage that, that has been done then? I mean, obviously you think well, there has been. Well, let's, let's, put it let's put it this way. I mean, who invented uh, psychoanalysis? I mean, let, me, let me say this, for whom was it invented? because it was invented by a Jew. And most, well, I won't say most, but a great many of the people who are now in psychoanalysis are Jews, and a disproportionate number are Jewish women. And while I agree with Pat that it is unfair to a uh, Catholic girl that she can't be an, an altar girl, uh, still she is baptized, and she is confirmed, yeah. and she enjoys a communion. A little yeah. Jewish girl she may sees have equality the day after th she's born, but then from the right. from then on it's downhill. Right, but the church really doesn't, you know, discriminate that much yeah. against children. But when I was a little yeah, girl, right. I asked my mother, "Why doesn't God like girls?" Now this for a little girl, for a little girl, is mind blowing, and you have to realize that children exaggerate everything anyway. Yeah. So a little girl sees the fuss made over a bris. And she sees that there's some great power attached to being uh, to being a male, and she sees, especially in American Jewish life, there's. Uh, I don't think I have to elaborate on the fuss made over a bar mitzvah, and she sees this tremendous fuss made over the bar mitzvah. Um, the there's a repressed. Uh, still, you know, it, it's difficult to rebel because to rebel against this, you're rebelling against religion and against God, so that you stifle your anger and you internalize it, and you, you're angry and you and you feel inferior. And yes, yeah, I, w I would just like to apply it again now. Mm -hmm. all, of, uh, all of what you've said makes an awful lot of sense, but it w uh, you can apply it over into society. Now, for instance, uh, I'll say, uh, I, I read this thing in doing some research. Mm -hmm. This is a little thing that was in the New York Times in 19, as late as 1954. Uh, the working mother is called harmful. A Catholic conference warns on the millions of women who help destroy the home. And a resolution was approved at the closing session of the three-day National Catholic Family Life Conference said, quote, untold millions of married women are actually helping in the destruction of the very homes they seek to serve. And I like that word serve, in other words, the subservient role in the home, by obtaining employment on the frequently false plea of economic need. Now, <laughs> knowing human nature, very few people go out on a nine to five job unless they really have to. Uh, now, the conference was also critical of young married couples who postpone having families on the ground that they need time to pay accumulated bills. Well, I think that you, to pay accumulated bills is a terribly important thing if you're, if you're forming a family unit, and I think it's their business, and I don't think that any church, male church hierarchy, has the right to criticize the church, who really are the grassroots people. Now, this, this kind of thing, the reason I'm bringing it up is this kind of thing points up the damage that the religious philosophy can do carried over into the social order. Now, millions of women would read this in the New York Times and other newspapers and become completely brainwashed. Well, it's a terrible thing for them to go out and work. Really, it's an awful, terrible thing. They are supposed to be subservient within their shoebox, four walls at home. And if they are going to use their minds, their intellect, or do anything they want, or for instance, if they have an IQ of 185, or they have a doctorate, or an advanced degree or something, they're still supposed to stay in that home because they got married. You know, I mean, this is, this is the damage. So the, the women are completely confused. Uh, and there are an awful lot of other examples, but uh, 
we can move on to other points. Is that really a religious issue, though? Oh, it, it has its roots. I mean, is, is that not uh, you know, the, the extending? Church, uh, well, when the church used to have missions, I remember growing up as a kid, they would have the missions, and all the married women would have to go to a particular mission for a week. You know, they have prayer service and all of this for a week. And uh, the women were always uh, exhorted to, uh, uh, it was a terrible thing to go out and work, for instance. You shouldn't, you shouldn't leave your home. You shouldn't go out. If you, and uh, if you're married, you, your place is in the home, and and uh, you you must be subservient. Then you get back into the Saint Paul thing, the five Ephesians in the in the uh, Bible, where Saint Paul says, uh, uh, "Women be subject to your husbands, as uh, as you would the Lord." You That's know, in other words, uh, equating equating the male of the house with with the deity, <laughs> and making the woman subservient and obedient to the to the male. May I just point out here that the Orthodox rabbi said something uh, almost identical. Uh, coalition of Orthodox rabbis held a press conference in which they denounced the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, feminist, <laughs> brazen, we called us brazen, arrogant feminist. And uh, they said, a central tenet of our faith is the uniqueness of the respective roles of men and women. This amendment is the Equal Rights Amendment, directly threatens our rights to continue practicing our faith as we have for the past three centuries in America. Literally, that means in a strictly sexist sense. And they go in later in the press conference uh, to point out that the very different religious education uh, that children get, boys are given study of Torah, more spiritual studies, uh, girls are given typing and stenography and the uh, dietary laws. <laughs> how to be a good Jewish wife. May I say something else here uh, about another way in which Orthodox Judaism denigrates women, and these are the laws of family purity. Everybody knows that pigs are unclean. Well, so are menstruating women, as far as Orthodox Jews are concerned. Uh, a woman is considered nidda or unclean from the day she first menstruates. That, not, uh, that is from the day of a first, uh, first day of a period. Uh, until seven days from the end of her period. At the end of that time, she is still unclean until she goes to the mikvah, which is a uh, ritual bath. And then, and only then, can uh, not only can she have intercourse with her husband, but during this period of uncleanness, he can't even touch her, and he can't touch any object that's been touched by her. During these two weeks, it's generally about two weeks, uh, he can't even sleep, according to some very devout Jews, they won't even sleep in the same bed unless they're both fully clothed. Now, there are all sorts of spiritual rationale given for this, but the message that a woman gets about this, obviously, is that there's something very unclean about her body and about menstruation. And a psychologist at Berkeley University uh, has d uh, discovered that Orthodox Jewish women suffer from the most menstrual pain of any group of women. That's incredible. Pat, you wanted to say something? Um, oh, for the moment it escapes me what I was going well, to say. Had so okay, many, I have a question so then. Um, what would it take then to make women spiritually free? Well, um, what I have in mind is, uh, see, I would like to get back to the original thought that Jesus was a feminist. I'm convinced that he himself was a feminist, uh, in that he believed in the true equality of women, the true flowering of the spiritualization of women uh, in, uh, uh, on the same level or as an independent human being, we'll put it that way, full personhood and full spiritual being. Uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, the women were very much uh, put down in, in his day and uh, it was considered obscene for a woman to be seen walking the street with a rabbi, for instance, or uh, even a man in many cases. Uh, and she was also forbidden to attend religious services. But now Jesus came along and uh, accepted women as his followers is on an equal level with men. And uh, I'm convinced also that he had apostles, women apostles. And many of the chief top events of his life his first witnesses were women, and, and that was unheard of in his day from a religious point of view. The one about Martha and Mary, uh, Jesus was uh, visiting them, and uh, Martha was busying herself in the kitchen, and apparently uh, she wanted uh, Mary to come out and help her, and Mary was devoted to uh, listening to Jesus uh, teach in uh, the other room. So uh, Jesus said to uh, 
Martha that uh, Mary had chosen the better part. In other words, he respected the fact that she was there interested in the intellectual pursuits, and if uh, she didn't care to be in the kitchen, then that was just fine. Her place wasn't necessarily out there in the kitchen. Uh, this, oh, go ahead, this. <laughs> well, I, I, if I can yes, add, I, uh, I, I, I agree with Pat on that point. And as far as it, would, as it would take to give women spiritual equality in Judaism, uh, this really would take a reconstruction of Judaism, because as Judaism is now historically formulated, uh, the symbol, true, the symbol between God and the Jewish people is the penis, and it's right there in Genesis. Sure. If I make, if I may quote, uh, according to Genesis, God made a covenant between uh, Abraham, between himself and Abraham, and Abraham's seed after him which is the Israelites or the Jewish people. And God said in uh, Genesis chapter 17, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And a later verse repeats this theme. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Is you don't get into the covenant unless you have a penis, well, and unless he follows that same yes. phallic thought all the way through the whole of Christianity, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, the whole worship of the ph uh, the phallic worship is the thing that stands out: the male and the respect for the male, uh, and uh, the the choice that the or the preference for the male child over the female child throughout throughout mm -hmm. history and all of the laws, again, the yeah. laws that uh, fit men rather than women. I mean, you're both yeah. saying some very radical things, actually, and I'm probably going to upset a lot of people. W what, what kind of response do you get? May I, mean, I define just define the word radical? We're trying to get to the root causes. Why is there such a need for such a thing as the liberation movement, as far as women is concerned? Why was it necessary? It became necessary, I believe, uh, for the full uh, expression of women, the full flowering of women, uh, respect for their intellect, uh, and as women became educated, they became uh, knowledgeable on why they are in a state of oppression, why uh, so many, why they have been second-class or non-class citizens for so many generations or centuries, I might say, and many of the causes get right back to religion. I, I want to know what women who don't agree with you are saying. And how, and how you answer them. I'm sure women must say to you, for instance, all right, yeah. we have uh, mm -hmm. a woman rabbi now, we have, we have this, we have that, you know, women can be counted in the minion in some places and so on. We've come a long way. I mean, wh what's your answer to that? I say, well, these are just tokens. Uh, th these are just tokens being thrown by the Jewish clergy to assuage the anger of Jewish feminists. And I think it should be borne in mind that you would generally find more women at a feminist meeting than you will find at a synagogue meeting, and it's no accident. Or do the Catholic women are still waiting for the tokens? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it still doesn't change the fact that historically Judaism has been rooted in the feeling that the man is more important, and you find this theme throughout uh, throughout the Bible. And I want to emphasize that this is not just limited to religious women. Because being Jewish is not just a religion, it's an ethnic identity. And many, many American Jews uh, are not religious, but do uh, identify as Jews, and they will have a bris for their sons, and they will have a bar mitzvah for their sons, and they will tell their children about their Jewish heritage. And when the heritage uh, is, so, is so male oriented, uh, nothing will do but an absolutely radical restructuring. And also, if you will look at the Old Testament, you will find the words for God are Father, Lord, Shepherd. They're all in the male. We simply have to find a concept of God that is neither male nor female. I might say that Mary Daly has a new book, Beyond God the Father, that just came out. Well, it came out in November of 73, and uh, she's calling God a verb now. Mm -hmm. She's way out there because she can't... Uh, she can't say, uh, she, she just can't say that uh, God is a male 
because if you're going to believe the Bible or Genesis or anything about the creation of ma male and female, and uh, God created male and female in his image, its image or their image or whatever image, you've got to have some kind of an image of, of God other than just a male figure. Pat, I want to know what you, you both see for the future. I mean, do you see uh, religion surviving as it is today, or do you think there's going to be a tremendous upheaval? Well, I say, Sandy, that there is a tremendous upheaval in Christianity right at the moment. I think that the Catholic Church is, um, uh, you, you go to different parts, of the, uh, different nations of the world, the Church is floundering, or its attendance, we say the Church attendance is floundering in many areas of the world. Uh, uh, I think the Pope, for instance, lost the uh, the uh, uh, full world, uh, lost credibility in the Catholic world with his uh, Humanae Vitae encyclical, for instance, on uh, against contraception under any form in as late as 1968. I think that uh, the Catholic bishops, for instance, in Bogota, Colombia, are passing out contraceptives and also instructing the women how to use the pill. They're saying, you don't use the pill one day and give it to your husband the next day. What you do is you use the pill every day because the machismo that exists in that country that is just prostrate in, in uh, uh, squalor and poverty is uh, the machismo there is that the man feels that he's not masculine a male unless he has at least ten children and of course the women are dying off at a young age you know multiple wives it's coming and it's going to be a radical change but I think that the, I, think, it's here I think women I think women really are going to have an equality are going to insist on having an equality within the religious bodies and I believe that they're going to bring back uh, bring about a, an awful lot of changes but I do think that we've got to straighten out the the problem we've got to have freedom of the uterus that's another okay, whole question listen, we have <laughs> we are completely out of time <laughs> and I'm very sorry I wish we had lots more time thank you very much thank you, thank you. See you next week.